Welcome. Uh, good. Thanks, John. Shall I uh, hop into it? And uh, um... well, at least let me say the title: Monetary Policy and Its Unintended Consequences. Raghu Rajan from Chicago, speaking all the way. Are you in Chicago? Are you in Chicago? Yeah, I am okay. in, Chicago, <laughs> in my office. Well, okay. Uh, thanks, John, for having me. Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, you gave a previous talk at the Swiss National Bank, and then you wrote a book in 2017. I think I was the guy who followed you in giving a talk, and they typically ask you to write a book, uh, but I've been defaulting for a number of years, so this is why it's a 2023 book rather than a I book. wondered, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I finally put pen to paper, and uh, you know I did the easy thing, which is put together a bunch of speeches I've given over the years. The nice thing is the speeches have been pretty consistent, uh, <laughs> saying, uh, monetary policy has its limits and its downsides come from trying too hard. So I think we're, we're on a similar page, uh, uh, John. Uh, Alan Sanderson sent me this cartoon, which is kind of a summary of what I'm going to say, uh, which is, uh, look, we don't need to go to the extremes on monetary policy to get reasonable outcomes. <laughs> that uh, perhaps we can uh, we can stop uh, at some point. Um, so, uh, what's the uh, what's the details? Uh, well, uh, clearly we are in a period where we have high inflation coming down, of course. But uh, uh, worries going forward about potential fiscal and financial dominance. And uh, the question that I ask is, uh, do central banks have a, any responsibility for how we got here? A and uh, we also had some changes, uh, most prominently in the Fed of central bank frameworks. Well, how does that play out? Uh, partly on the inflation financial stability angle, but also partly on what happens next now that we're way above uh, any norm on average inflation, uh, are we going to see a substantial contraction induced by the Fed to uh, make up the uh, sort of uh, uh, the backlog on uh, on inflation? So I'm going to use the Fed as an example, not because I think the Fed is particularly egregious in these matters, but it's the leading central bank in the world, and I think it's uh, it offers a lot of uh, of, uh, of data to uh, to uh, see what's happening. So, um, you know, why are we in the current situation? And of course, uh, um, you know, there's a lot that has to do with the supply side. Uh, ben Bernanke emphasizes this, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, the consequences of the pandemic to good uh, supply, uh, the uh, extraordinary fiscal and monetary response, which uh, obviously affected demand. Uh, basically, a lot of stuff happened. But I want to argue that much had changed before then. Uh, the uh, post-GFC lowflation was an important factor, uh, with US PC inflation averaging about 1.4% in 2012 and 2020, way below the 2% target. And I would argue this created a lot of pressure on central banks even before the pandemic to do something. Uh, from the political side, you could argue it was, uh, you know, the commentary was he who bailed out Wall Street and neglected Main Street. What are you going to do about us? <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, you're underperforming your inflation target, isn't there some stimulus that you're not delivering? Uh, can't you do better? And of course, uh, you know, uh, central banks did try doing some things, including quantitative easing. And uh, to some extent, this also uh, then created pressure on other central banks. I remember, you know, in Basel meetings, one European central banker who shall remain unnamed kept telling me that the U.S. with its quantitative easing is putting tremendous <coughs> pressure on us to join in because otherwise we're seeing the euro appreciate and we really have to do something about that. Otherwise, our growth is also being held back. So even as some central banks expanded in uh, accommodation in innovative ways, <laughs> it's spilled over. And this is a point that John makes in his, in his book also. Um, and, and central bankers didn't reject the responsibility. 
uh, of doing something. Uh, remember the mantra, monetary policy is the only game in town. Well, uh, essentially, it put pressure on them to do something. And uh, given that they were already at the zero lower bound, the natural thing to do was to embark on unconventional monetary policy. I would argue that the first elements of that, uh, which was repairing markets, uh, which was consistent with what happened in QE1, was probably sensible uh, and did have uh, fairly positive effects. Um, it, it took the uh, it took the guise of uh, uh, Draghi and his uh, you know uh, uh, attempt to prevent fragmentation of the European market with his ordinary uh, monetary transactions and his famous speech in uh, which he ended by saying, believe me, it will be enough. Uh, that created confidence that the, um, uh, the ECB would support sovereign debt and uh, elevated the prices of sovereign debt uh, at least for a certain period. So um, uh, this was, uh, I think, uh, what many would see as uh, not necessarily a bad thing and uh, may have actually also helped uh, restore bank health. But uh, it went further with uh, QE2, QE3, and then the pandemic QE in the Fed, but also uh, with QE in, uh, in the ECB, asset purchases, uh, including of government debt in an attempt uh, to somehow further activity through mechanisms that we can, uh, we can debate. Um, forward guidance was also uh, an important element. Uh, you know, trust me, we won't elevate interest rates until nothing such happens. And sometimes the two came together, uh, QE uh, essentially giving a time frame over which the Fed would remain on hold uh, with the kind of accompanying statement saying, so long as we're doing QE, uh, trust us, we're not going to raise interest rates. And to some extent, uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, Fed actually respected this kind of message by waiting until it terminated QE before it started raising interest rates in, uh, in March of 2022, and similarly with the European Central Bank. And of course, some banks also engaged in directed credit programs. Um, what the Fed did, which went further than other central banks, was it also changed frameworks. Uh, I would argue that the way the Fed changed its framework was consistent with Paul Krugman's famous exhortation that central banks should commit to being more uh, rationally irresponsible in an attempt to elevate inflation. And, uh, and for the non-economists here, uh, the idea is basically, uh, you know, if I'm a central bank that is preemptive, wards off inflation at the first sign in the future, uh, perhaps that constrains inflation today and keeps it excessively low. If, on the other hand, I say, look, I'm going to stare inflation, stare at it for a while, uh, <clears throat> you know, see if it's sustainable, not take any action, be more relaxed about it. Uh, then perhaps uh, the uh, prospect of future inflation will elevate current inflation. Uh, whatever the rationale, uh, it did turn out the Fed was uh, put in place uh, aspects that would imply that it would no longer be preemptive. Uh, the whole mantra that if you see inflation in the eyeballs, it's too late, was thrown out of the window. Instead, you were going to watch it, uh, measure it, look to see if it was sustainable before acting. So uh, targeting average inflation over an undefined period helped in that because it said once you saw inflation, you could afford to wait for a while until inflation caught up with the average that you were targeting uh, because you had underperformed in the past. Um, other measures made you more relaxed, uh, included an, an employment goal, which was broad-based and inclusive. Uh, unfortunately, minorities are hired at the end of the uh, job cycle. And so that made you, again, uh, more likely to be patient, to wait till uh, you know, uh, minority hiring uh, started and, and, and went on. And of course, rather than minimizing uh, deviations from maximum employment, you made it one-sided. You emphasized shortfalls from maximum employment as the Fed's concern. So variety of reasons.
how the Fed's framework changed and made it a little more relaxed about inflation. Uh, what were the micro effects of these actions? Asset prices rose, leverage built up, uh, and we have some evidence for uh, you know the effects. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes in, in fairly positive directions, uh, the efforts to repair specific markets uh, through explicit or implicit guarantees, implicit guarantees of the kind that Draghi gave, seem to work in recapitalizing banks and driving more lending, and uh, Directed lending, which some central banks did, also expanded the flow of credit to targeted segments. There are papers on all these. The macro effects, uh, as some of you in the room have pointed out, are harder to discern. Uh, perhaps the effect that I believe most strongly is, is what was uh, uh, determined by uh, Arvind Krishnamurti and Anit Vissing Jorgensen, uh, who suggested that QE seemed to signal that monetary policy will remain low for long. Uh, again, the point that uh, uh, I made earlier, so long as the central bank is buying assets, it won't raise rates. And there seems to be some evidence of that. Harder to find evidence uh, more generally, uh, including on real activity. And there's this uh, tongue-in-cheek paper by Favo, Lubos Pastor, my colleague and others, which examines 54 studies on the effects of QE on output and inflation and basically finds they're a mixed bag. Uh, central bankers that did QE typically report statistically significant QE effects on output, but only half the academic papers do. What I thought was the most interesting uh, finding was the Bundesbank, which has historically been against QE, is the one central bank which finds an even lower effect than the academics. So uh, the bottom line is, this is an area where it's really hard to find effects. And I think if it's hard to find effects uh, uh, generally, you have to worry about whether it's an effective tool uh, and should be used in the, in the future because it also has downsides. Um, one of the downsides didn't seem to matter early on, which is you tend to anesthetize government bond markets because there's a big buyer. Uh, how much of a role that plays? I think we will have to wait to find out. Uh, but certainly it seemed that, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, might play a part if there was uh, pressure on the government to raise financing quickly, as turned out to be the case during the pandemic. Now, um, the, the other problems that uh, emerge once you start thinking about the way central banks operate is that when central buy banks buy long-term government debt, during the process of quantitative easing and issue reserves to finance it, you're essentially financing a long-term asset with a liability which has infinite maturity but zero duration. It reprices every day. That's what a reserve is. And uh, what that effectively does is shorten the duration of the consolidated bank government balance sheet. Another way of saying this is the central bank does a kind of uh, asset swap uh, with the public by taking their long-term paper and giving them short-term paper in return. But when you consolidate the balance sheet of the central bank and the government, essentially the long-term paper the government has put out uh, has been converted in some measure to short-term paper. So in a period where interest rates on long-term debt were really low, you were adding to the process of shortening the debt, uh, the maturity of government debt. Uh, one example uh, worked out in the UK is when you look at the UK's average debt maturity, it's 15 years. When you looked at the median maturity, it was 11 years. But if you looked at the median maturity after accounting for QE, it went down to four years. Why does that matter? It matters because when interest rates move up, it very quickly leads to higher debt service, higher fiscal deficits, and potential fiscal dominance of the kind that sometimes uh, John talks about. Not so much in terms of, um, I, I think more in terms of uh, perhaps becoming a factor in central bank thinking as it raises interest rates, because this will impact government budget deficits in a serious way also, and therefore limit uh, 
uh, central bank policy. Um, other effects, uh, uh, I've talked before uh, in this forum about the consequences of commercial bank balance sheet expansion to keep pace with central bank balance sheet expansion. Let me just show you some graphs, uh, uh, especially since we've um, you know, had uh, Silicon Valley Bank earlier in the year. Uh, when central bank balance sheets expand, commercial bank balance sheets also have to expand to finance that central bank balance sheet expansion. Uh, it's it's not a given, it, it, but it does happen, and I'll show you in just a second. Uh, basically, commercial banks increase their holdings of reserves financed with uninsured demandable deposits. They also reduce time deposits, at least that was the case in the U.S., and increase credit lines. Effectively, you've got a commercial bank balance sheet, which on the one hand has many more liquid reserve assets, but also has many more uh, runnable liabilities. Here's what, what the graphs look like. Uh, what you have uh, a, a, in, in blue here is reserves uh, are, and the vertical dashed lines uh, represent QE1, QE2, QE3. Uh, post QE is the period the Fed did relatively little. QT1 is when it actively shrank its balance sheet. Uh, turns out uh, in terms of bank reserves, both uh, you know, contributed to a decline in bank reserves. Uh, but then you had in September 2019, all hell break loose in the financial markets. The Fed went back into quantitative easing to supply reserves to the banking sector. That's what happens in 2019. And of course, in uh, March 2020, uh, the Fed goes back full steam with quantitative easing as the pandemic hits and increases its, its reserves once again to a very high level. So that's the reserve buildup. After 2022, it started coming down sharply until Silicon Valley Bank happened, after which bank reserves went up once again because the Fed supplied reserves to the banking system through special facilities. Uh, if you look at demand deposits, uh, if you look at deposits more generally, you see them also going up as reserves go up but in a much more secular fashion. When the reserves go down, the deposits don't go down, they keep going up. And what is particularly interesting is credit lines. These are undrawn credit lines. These are also claims on bank liquidity issued by the commercial banks. They also go up steadily with the various uh, periods of QE and also with, uh, uh, with the pandemic QE. In other words, not only are banks issuing deposits, they're also issuing other claims on liquidity directly to uh, firms, uh, which they can call down in times of trouble. And they do call them down in times of trouble, as you can see, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, as, as you saw during the uh, initial days of the pandemic. We break down deposits uh, into time uh, and demand. What you find is time deposits are coming down while demand deposits are going up, but within demand deposits, it's most prominently the uninsured demand deposits. That's the dark line, uh, which is going up tremendously over time. And uh, that's been a source of concern. Now, uh, if you look within banks, uh, the uninsured demand deposits right. have been going up. Uh, any question? Sorry. Uninsured insured. Some of that, when you're given you have this over 15 years or something, some right. of that's the fact that the limit, the the insured limit, is unindexed. Uh, so it yeah. be a natural upward drift anyway, as people got richer and held more. Well, it went up from 100 to 250. There uh, and but, that. But be, before this down. period, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it went up from 100 to 250 and stayed at 250 for much of this period. So uh, that that's not a big factor, but but you're right. We should point out when that changed. Uh, the uh, but what what is interesting is that the uh, uninsured uh, uh, is going up particularly fast for the small and medium sized banks. It's going up for all banks, but it's going up for the small and medium sized banks most. That's the green line. Uh, the below fifty billion 
uh, bank size. I mean, 50 billion is pretty big size, but uh, but it's uh, on their si share of the uninsured is going up more. Um, what is uh, particularly <coughs> worrisome is if you look at their share, uh, their uninsured uh, demand deposits, uh, and it doesn't matter whether you add credit lines to this or not, you get a similar picture, and divide by their access to liquidity, that is their reserves, as well as the eligible assets that they can take to the Fed and get liquidity directly, you see that for the uh, small banks, the below 50 billion, it's been ratcheting up considerably fast. Uh, and uh, in fact, is now uh, just before the Silicon Valley Bank uh, happened, uh, was at a level consistent with the large banks. The large banks have been getting safer in the sense of uh, their ratio of claims on liquidity to available liquidity was much higher, has been coming down substantially. Some of this is the effect of LCR regulations, et cetera, on them. Medium-sized banks have been about flat, but the big concern is small banks have become much more exposed to, to liquidity, at least by this measure, which is the share of claims. Uh, on liquidity divided by available liquidity. What this means is when there is a shortage of liquidity, a dash for cash, uh, many of these banks are out on a limb. I mean, the most uh, egregious example was Silicon Valley Bank with 97% uninsured demand deposits uh, amongst its deposits. But there are a lot of banks uh, which uh, do not, do not yeah. so much on a limb are uh, are pretty exposed, and uh, when everybody is running for uh, for uh, cash for reserves, uh, you uh, you know are, are the person who finds it hard to get a seat, uh, especially if at those times you find that banks also start holding. So this is again an unintended consequence of uh, of uh, uh, you know quantitative easing. You are changing risks in the uh, uh, in the commercial banks. And uh, importantly, uh, this is not taking into account any kind of search for yield, uh, which may entail these banks uh, also investing in long term, um, you know, high duration securities in order to uh, eke out an additional return, which again, uh, leaves them exposed uh, to losses when interest rates go up. Uh, we've seen that too happen. But even without that, uh, you have a lot of liquidity exposure, which creates potential problems. Um, so uh, uh, this is all a, a sort of a, a set of uh, arguments to say much had changed even before COVID. Remember, even the uh, the change in, in, in the Fed framework was well underway at, the, uh, at that time. Uh, and of course, COVID created a whole set of new problems, real disruptions, and massive fiscal expansion, and uh, and uh, you know the accompanying uh, monetary easing, including balance sheet expansion, to deal with the early days of COVID. Um, what this meant was uh, post recovery, and this is familiar ground to many of you. Uh, uh, given your change framework, uh, given that you uh, decided to wait till QE was done, uh, you couldn't react to inflation early. And, and so the Fed delayed uh, and had to catch up. Um, risks were higher in the banking system. Uh, we've already talked about the liability side changes, but there were also substantial asset ch side changes, uh, some of which Amit Seru and his co-authors have documented. Uh, a carry trade motivated by a search for yield uh, essentially uh, caused them to invest in long-term assets, which uh, uh, which essentially, um, you know, uh, became uh, much lower value when interest rates went up. So as uh, the Fed uh, sort of moved, uh, when the economy recovered, started raising interest rates and shifting QE to QT, uh, liquidity risk and solvency risk came to the fore, uh, deposit inflows turned to outflows, and uh, we saw the problems <clears throat> in Silicon Valley Bank. Now, uh, 
the failure of these four banks may seem like small potatoes, right? After all, we've uh, uh, we've uh, we've solved the problem. Uh, you know, banking system risk is no longer a headline concern. But remember, there was unprecedented Fed and Treasury intervention to make this happen. Uh, effectively, all uninsured demand deposits were insured uh, uh, by the statements of the Fed and the Treasury. There was a new lending facility from the Fed and over $1 trillion in lending by the federal home loan banks, uh, which effectively uh, are um, you know, a way uh, for the Fed to intermediate funds to the, uh, to the banking system. Uh, what this did was, uh, you know, reserves were coming down at the banks, down to three uh, trillion. They've gone up to three point seven trillion, and incrementally, uh, uh, as the Fed engages in QT, where the reserves are coming off is really off the uh, off the uh, um, off the money market funds and not of the banks. What happens when uh, the money market funds no longer have reserves at the Fed and it starts cutting into bank reserves once again? Uh, we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens then. Uh, but what, <coughs> what Fed intervention has done is converted a possible panic into a slower burning problem. If long-term interest rates come down significantly, maybe there's no solvency problem <coughs> with banks anymore because all the losses that Amit and his co-authors have documented may in fact uh, be absorbed uh, reasonably easily. <clears throat> if, however, interest rates go up and stay up higher, uh, what you have is a much bigger problem of solvency coupled with liquidity in the banking system and, uh, and potential financial dominance as the Fed's ability to raise interest rates uh, becomes more constrained by the effects on, uh, on, on the financial sector. Now, uh, what uh, uh, bottom lines do we take away from this? I, I think, uh, you know, financial stability and monetary policy have become uh, deeply intertwined. Uh, many central bankers would not agree. They keep saying there's a separation principle. Uh, you know, the um, central bank worries about monetary policy, focus on, on economic activity and inflation. That's all it cares about. And the supervisors, uh, you know, focus on financial stability and make sure that that doesn't become a problem. Well, we've seen that uh, not working out particularly well. When the central bank has its foot firmly placed uh, on the accelerator, it's very hard for the supervisors and the regulators to somehow, uh, uh, you know, reduce uh, risk taking uh, within the system. Um, and uh, time and again, we've not seen this work out. Uh, one uh, 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 paper recently that caught my eye on this, which I want to uh, uh, just show you the principal graphs there. It's a paper by, uh, you know, uh, Jose Luis Pedro and co-authors co from the Bank of Spain and elsewhere. And uh, the left-hand graph, uh, the vertical axis is interest rates, and the vertical line is when a banking crisis starts. <coughs> and what they show is there's typically no pattern in interest rates when uh, bank crises don't happen. I, I, I don't know what you want to take away from that. But before every banking crisis, they find a U-shape in interest rates. First, interest rates are cut. That's when policy becomes really accommodative. That's when the risks start uh, you know, being taken. And then, uh, perhaps because of inflation, uh, policy tightens considerably, and that's when the crisis gets set off, and then things go downward uh, for, for some time. Um, uh, that's true of every crisis. Uh, they look at uh, a, a large number of crises over the 21st and 20th century. Uh, they have different crisis definitions. That's the <coughs> second graph. Uh, and they look at post-World War crises. The picture is always the same. Uh, easy money followed by tight money uh, typically uh, leads to a crisis. Now, I don't know if there's a theorem or if there's a, a rule that comes from this, but it does say that it's very hard to 
affect separation of monetary uh, policy and financial stability. Of course, we haven't even talked about how these unusual monetary policies have uh, put perhaps um, you know, created some kind of fiscal space and even fiscal dominance uh, consequently. I mean, what was the role of QE in limiting fiscal concerns as Congress and Parliament spend? Uh, I don't know. I think it's worth finding out. And uh, of course, we've already talked about the consequence of QE in raising interest sensitivity of the consolidated debt and whether there's some unpleasant fiscal arithmetic to come. Again, we have to wait and see. So last point, and I'll end there. Um, you know, uh, what should central banks do on frameworks going forward? That, that's the last question I want to tackle. Um, you know, Augustine Karsten from the BIS uh, you know, points to a way of categorizing inflation regime, regimes. There's a low inflation regime when price shocks do not feed on each other uh, and inflation may be low, even too low and below targets. And there's a high inflation regime where price shocks become more correlated and you get generalized inflation quickly, uh, in which case central banks need to react quickly and preemptively almost to head off generalized inflation. Uh, certainly our recent experience has been of this kind, whether you can write down a model to capture this effectively, uh, I will leave uh, as a question. But if this is true, if you have the low inflation regime, remember, uh, 2014, oil prices went through the roof, but inflation didn't budge. It somehow seemed to absorb all that uh, without a pickup in inflation. Maybe expectations were entrenched. Um, but, uh, but more recently, it's been, uh, you know, that uh, uh, has not been as true uh, that we have had, uh, you know, sharper inflation uh, rises. And of course, one of the worries right now is if we have another oil shock, uh, will that uh, upset this process of uh, declining inflation, even though it is merely a supply shock? So uh, maybe uh, if this is all true, uh, you need a different framework for each regime. But of course, how do you keep changing frameworks? Uh, you have the very relaxed uh, regime when you want to pump up inflation. Uh, that's the regime we are in right now. Average inflation targeting, at least, uh, you know, in the period when past inflation was really low, gave you the ability to accommodate inflation. But now, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe we need a, a a stronger regime, which is more anti-inflation, the preemptive regime, which we had in the past. How do you shift? And uh, really, it's impossible to shift. You can't keep shifting frameworks. You need one framework for all regimes. So do you adopt the easy, <coughs> relaxed uh, regime that we have currently, uh, or do you adopt a preemptive regime that we had in the past? <coughs> and I would argue uh, maybe the answer has to do with uh, transitions. Uh, the transition between a low uh, inflation to a high inflation regime under a relaxed framework is really problematic because you wait too long, financial risks build up when the policy is accommodative, and financial instability can result as you try and catch up by raising rates quickly. Maybe we have been lucky this time, but if we want to take the lessons from all this, I would say perhaps we should fix the framework that contains high inflation and not worry too much about low inflation unless it becomes galloping deflation. Uh, we don't have too many cures for low inflation, but whatever cures we have uh, may be worse than the disease. Maybe we learn to live with low inflation uh, while not uh, making too much of a fetish about it. Bottom line, uh, I think, is central banks perhaps can achieve more by doing less. Uh, and uh, I'll stop there. Happy to take questions. So the first question is from Bob Hall. So you didn't say anything about real interest rates, but in principle, they have a central role uh, over this period. The, the short-term real interest rate, the one-year interest rate in the U.S. at the beginning of 2022 was minus 6%, um, which just an intensely... Uh, expansionary value uh, 
And since the economy was already at full employment, um, that that's the source of the inflation. So it's a it's 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 a self building. Uh, and, and, you know, this instability is well known, but uh, people just don't talk about it. That's reversing now, of course. The, the, the policy rate was in real terms, and for some reason the, the Fed never talks about the policy rate in real terms, even though in the, in, the, uh, in the Taylor rule, it's written out in real terms plainly. So, so there's just a huge error in thinking uh, and, there, and there's been a big swing of rising real interest rates, and I think we're beginning to see the consequences of that uh, in real activity. Um, but of course, we're also seeing the disinflation, and the disinflation is traceable directly to the rapid increase in real interest rates that has occurred. I, I don't disagree with anything you've just said. Uh, I, I guess the the only thing I would uh, I would add to what you said is why did they not act when real interest rates went uh, seriously negative and they saw uh, you know that this would have uh, consequences and i think they were held held back uh, in part uh, by their framework um, in, in part uh, you know uh, by their attempt to validate quantitative easing as an effective tool uh, wait till you end it. We said we would end it by this time, or we have to say that we'll end it before we start raising the So uh, I, I think they were prisoners of uh, of a bunch of things, uh, including uh, perhaps the, the hope that somehow all this would go away and they wouldn't uh, go back to low inflation without them having to do too much. Question here and then by, uh, my... uh, on the on the bank sector, um, you've laid out how the rising interest rates are, you know, causing bank distress uh, with the Silicon Valley episode. Uh, but also, we were worried about the health of the banking sector when interest rates are very low in the previous regime. Um, you know, profitability was was severely compressed in, in banking sectors. So, is it not fair to say that the policy rate consistent with a healthy banking sector seems to be somehow shrinking or at least much more constrained than say in the 90s when we had uh, bond sell-offs in 1994, which did not cause a banking crisis. Um, and I just had one very short point. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the point um, that the average maturity uh, was so severely shortened by QE and, and what the, in your view, the underlying policy rationale was to, to compress the maturity so drastically. Right. Thanks. So um, on the uh, first point, uh, you know, what is the golden uh, range of, uh, of policy rates in which banks can thrive? Um, you know, that's, I think that's an important question. I, I, it's, uh, it's hard to pick a number there, but, but it, is, uh, it is true that certainly in the United States, partly as a result of uh, uh, a lot of the regulations that have been imposed on the banks, uh, banks are becoming less and less of uh, of balance sheet creatures and more and more uh, off balance sheet creatures, right? So, uh, for example, a lot of the loans that banks make are uh, sort of uh, uh, put into collateral loan, loan obligations. Those become the uh, balance sheet vehicles to hold the loans, while banks then uh, make fees from the origination but also make additional fees from, from offering lines of credit uh, to these uh, collateral loan obligation vehicles so that they become emergency funders rather than funders all the time. And uh, you know why are they emergency funders? It may have something to do with their access to central bank liquidity, which makes them more effective uh, um, emergency funders. So it may be that these consequences are, are less important for US banks than for European banks, but, but certainly there is an issue of what the appropriate uh, range is within which banks can flourish. The problem with uh, too low for too long is, uh, uh, you know, banks tend to then fund uh, a lot more risk in an attempt to eke out uh, interest rates. I mean, you, you uh, saw the specter of Silicon Valley Bank taking duration risk, uh, 
because there's nothing to earn on short-term reserves, uh, why not take 10-year bonds? Uh, after all, interest rates have been low for long, and they'll stay low for long, and we'll be fine. Uh, and obviously, that's that's a huge mistake. Um, the point about QE is, uh, let me try and make it uh, as transparent as I can. Um, uh, the central bank buys government paper from the hands of the public. Uh, so let's say it buys 10-year paper. And then it, uh, you know, for the sake of, uh, uh, of simplicity, it issues uh, reserves to the entities it buys the paper from. So from the perspective of the public, they've exchanged 10-year paper for overnight reserves uh, on the central bank. Uh, from the perspective of the government uh, and the central bank combined, the liabilities now consist of the uh, tenure paper that is still outstanding with the public, plus a whole bunch of reserves that the central bank has issued. So the average duration of the debt of the government is the weighted average maturity of those, uh, which has come down because the central bank has done this financing. Now, the uh, point, of course, that uh, uh, maybe John Cochran would raise immediately is why don't you, why doesn't the Treasury extend the maturity of its debt? Well, part of the rationale for um, why the central bank wanted to buy this long term paper out of the hands of the public was some sort of thought that there would be a portfolio rebalance, that they would go towards the long end. Uh, in other investments, maybe in private sector uh, lending or in uh, in uh, uh, in other ways, and uh, and uh, so therefore it would be uh, it, it wouldn't particularly be effective QE if the Fed took the long term paper out of the public's hands and then the Treasury issued it back into their hands. You wouldn't get the portfolio rebound. <clears throat> But I, I, you know, some of our work suggests you don't get the portfolio rebalancing for another reason also, which is the uh, the banks themselves shorten the maturity of their liabilities and become less positioned to fund long term assets uh, when QE takes place. So that's another reason in addition to what I just said. Dan, sorry, then then John, Dan, thanks. Uh, Ariel, I just <clears throat> I just wanted to get uh, your reaction to a recent book. Ask if you've taken a look at it and what you think. Called "The Lords of Easy Money" <laughs> by this guy uh, Christopher uh, Leonard. You familiar with that? And what do you think? If you are, I am not. If you tell me what the gist is, I can react. But uh, I prefer to read <laughs> okay. it. I prefer <laughs> to read it and then react more effectively to you. So uh, let me look for it. Okay. The gist is that. It's sort of a, a journalist anecdotal accounting of the real effects of the, the zero interest rate policy for so long. And I was just wondering if, if you thought this guy was a crackpot or, or not. But <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't say without reading, but what I'll say is we came out with a report from the group of 30 maybe a week back. Uh, the re report is authored by... Marcus Brunemeyer, but a whole bunch of us have signed on to it. And uh, that basically makes this point, look, let's not try uh, to do too much uh, as central banks. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of the instruments we're trying to create, low for long, low forever, uh, actually have side effects. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not one directional, and we have to worry about some of those. Thanks. Okay, John Cochran. I want to make a couple comments. Roger, this was great. Um, one, I'm, I'm glad to infer you're, you're joining the team that sees the long period of the zero bound as not a particular problem. There was, back in the time, tremendous worry about here comes the deflation spiral, here comes the deflation spiral, uh, tremendous, we need to provide more stimulus. And uh, um, in retrospect, I think that was all a mistake. A wonderful paper by Bob Hall and Marianne Kudlayak, we just saw on Monday, essentially saying we were at the natural unemployment rate the whole time, which I loved. Uh, second uh, point, um, um, it is uh, interesting, why did they not move faster? Now, some of it was they had pledged average inflation targeting, whatever, but some of it was surely failures of perception. They kept saying, oh, it's just supply shocks, oh, it's just particular prices, oh, it's just things that'll all go away. 
uh, their forecasts never showed the inflation. So the long, it's not just the working out of the promise for average inflation targeting. There was also a tremendous lack of perception that somehow needs to be fixed. I'm curious at your view of the end of inflation. Uh, Bob Hall said, which now I'll disagree with Bob. Oh, of course, they raised real interest rates. Inflation went down. But the mechanism there is supposed to be raise real rates that hurts the economy and the magic of the Phillips curve brings inflation down. We didn't see that mechanism. The economy is still booming. And you know we've just barely got interest rates above. So my, my sort of view is the Fed's jumping out in front of the parade here. The parade's ending on its own and the Fed is claiming victory, but I'm, I'm curious on your view. And the last one, which will actually be a question. Uh, <laughs> Going forward, I think the you know the Fed is thinking, what's our new framework? Powell announced the search for the new framework. I think the ECB is doing the same, and I'm curious what you think on the new framework on on two dimensions. One, the joint fiscal, joint monetary policy, and financial obviously have to talk to each other. Uh, the UK, you didn't mention the hilarious part of the UK, where pretty much on the same day. The monetary policy people said we're going to quantitative tightening and the financial stability people said we're going to quantitative ease and we're going to do both at the same time. Our stress tests, not even at, we're asking about interest rate declines as the monetary policy was asking about interest rates going up. Clearly, these two people need to talk to each other. But the second issue for the framework is um, are bygones still going to be bygones? <laughs> and I, I was very interested, you mentioned the heretical possibility that maybe average inflation targeting works in the other direction. Uh, the American voter understands that price level is not inflation rate, even if some of our politicians don't understand the difference between price levels and inflation rates. Uh, should a, a uh, new framework going forward, first of all, it needs, it, the old framework was a beautiful marginal line against deflation that forgot about what if the Germans come through Belgium again. Perhaps we need one that has an inflation part and a deflation part. Uh, and perhaps we need to think about how much average inflation targeting or price level targeting or whatever our bygones, even 10% bygones gonna still be bygones in the future. So your th the question there was your thoughts on the new framework. Yeah, okay, let me start backwards. Uh, you know, the, uh, the new framework is gonna, uh, the old framework is, uh, is precisely gonna raise the question that you raised, right? Uh, are bygones gonna be bygones or do we have to uh, create a, a, a deflation uh, uh, in order to uh, compensate for the excessive inflation in the past? And uh, almost surely the answer is uh, we're gonna change. Uh, uh, you, uh, or you've seen very few people talk about average inflation targeting at the Fed over the last few months. And I think that's consistent with the idea that it is history. Um, I think they've rediscovered the Taylor rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in some ways. Uh, uh, on, the, on the UK, it's actually very interesting because they squared the circle. The point you made, uh, Q, QE on one, uh, QT on one side with the monetary side, and QE on the fiscal side. Now they can actually do that because they have two different committees and they can say yeah. one committee proposed QT and the other committee, though the Bank of England governor is the chair of both committees. What, what was clever? <laughs> what was clever on, uh, 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 on uh, uh, the part uh, of the UK was they uh, essentially said this would be temporary. And uh, actually, uh, the governor announced an end date, which is Friday. Um, obviously, the big question is what would have happened if uh, they hadn't been successful by Friday? But uh, I am given to understand they actually knew that uh, if they did as much as they did in the interim period, that was enough to take care of the problem and they could actually exit on that Friday. So uh, it was a very targeted operation, but absolutely, this is the problem. More generally, John, you asked me a question <clears throat> last time we, uh, we talked on why the Fed couldn't keep intervening on a daily basis and provide the reserves that the market needed uh, as and when it needed it. Part of the problem is when you have a huge deficit, uh, which is likely to happen when you withdraw reserves in a big way, but you haven't shrunk the deposits uh, or the lines of credit as much, is that mismatch, that gap uh, can, uh, can become prominent uh, at any point, uh, creating the dash for cash at that point. Uh, 
And so the safe uh, way to deal with it is to reduce the cap by providing more permanent reserves, which means you know, expanding your balance sheet once again. If you leave it to daily supply, then you make it a, a matter of does the Fed recognize the problem every day enough to provide what is needed? And we're talking hundreds of billions in supply rather than the uh, few billions it has to do every day. In other words, it becomes a semi, uh, it becomes a more um, semi-permanent problem rather than the problem of short-term uh, disruption. And that's why I think the Fed <coughs> moved after September 20, uh, 2019 to expand QE once again. Uh, we could talk about this more, but I think that's uh, on why inflation has come down. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you in the activity hasn't slowed as much. What seems to have slowed considerably are the supply disruptions that took place during the pandemic. And now you're seeing some action on, on rentals also. Some of the surge in rentals that took place uh, shortly after uh, you know, uh, work resumed, uh, I think that's quietening down. So it may well be some of all this quietens down without that <laughs> proverbial uh, slowdown, significant slowdown in activity. Will the Fed uh, sort of uh, stop at that point and say, uh, mission accomplished? Uh, I doubt it. I think it'll want to build some slack in the labor market. Okay. okay. Uh, Mike has Mike Bosca has a question. Yeah, I have a couple of questions and observations. First is, since the Fed adopted its two percent target, improvements have been made in the measurement of inflation that have reduced it by about forty or forty-five basis points. So maybe one point four percent wasn't so bad. That's number one. That's just a simple fact. Um, uh, they were also issuing a lot of different types of forward guidance, dot plots, et cetera, that led a lot of the banks to assume that rates were going to stay low for a long time, which kind of reinforced the behavior. And um, Michael Bordo might want to comment later on the fact that we've had long periods. Now, a lot's changed. We didn't have interest on reserves. We had Reg Q. We've, most of the credit is in the financial markets, not in the banks, et cetera. Uh, but we had long periods where we had 1% inflation and good growth. So... I um, just want to come back to that question. It's getting closer to John, not quite all the way. Maybe I'm heading that way asymptotically if I live that long. Um, and then uh, I think two other points I'd like specific questions I want to ask. Number one is you kind of mentioned this framework, this rethinking, et cetera, that led to the relaxation, um, but you're pretty quick and not fully complete on what led up to that. Um, they're thinking about how they had to rethink how they dealt with an era of low interest rates, et cetera, and how it became so asymmetric. I wonder if you want to add anything to um, maybe it was reasonable to take a look at it, but were the conclusions at all reasonable? I mean, some of that was the work of our former student, John Williams, by the way. So just kind of interested about that. And lastly, I think that something you kind of inferred but didn't really talk about was uh, we had central bank governors actively encouraging deficit spending, um, and which is a big reversal from the traditional role central bank governors have played when they've lectured our Congress on not getting involved in so much deficit spending. Now, you can argue in the midst of a collapse like the government ordered lockdowns and COVID was a temporarily a different situation. But it seemed to me that they also relaxed their concerns about fiscal policy, and that was not a good signal. So I wonder if you have any sense about that and what the appropriate role of a central bank governor is when I talk about those two things. Well, Gu, you want to react to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so inflation, 1%, not so bad. Absolutely. Agree with you. And uh, I, I think the big concern is galloping deflation. Uh, not seen that even in Japan, and, and we have to rethink whether it's uh, we need to be in such a busy, especially when we don't have strong tools to elevate inflation when it's when it's low. Um, on the framework, I mean, I, I don't know the thinking that went into into this, but I I, I agree with John Cochran that you know uh, in a sense uh, this became the the wrong framework for an era of higher inflation. And perhaps, I don't know how much thinking went into this, assuming that inflation, uh, somehow the biggest problem we had to deal with was low inflation and that it would stay that way 
uh, I mean, I, I think with the benefit of hindsight, we will uh, have something which is more robust to to regime. And uh, and how that will play out, I think, is would be very interesting. Uh, on the fiscal policy, I mean, I I I, uh, I sort of threw this out as a as a as a possible uh, uh, concern. That is, you know, uh, with central banks not wanting to seem to be an enemy of the people, given how much they were involved in in the rescue of the hated bankers. And uh, with, without too much of an explanation as to why that might be necessary, uh, I suspect uh, they were less willing to, uh, you know, enrage Congress by saying, uh, you know, we're going to stand against unwarranted spending. Uh, and of course, some of them, as you said, actively encouraged more fiscal, partly with the thought that it would take pressure of the central bank uh, uh, to try and uh, elevate activity, which uh, some of them felt was necessary when they were the only game in town. So uh, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm with you that, uh, uh, especially at this time, when you see uh, you know, uh, the deficit at a level which is unprecedented in, uh, in non-crisis times, uh, uh, combined with a Fed which is actually trying to slow activity, uh, it seems this is, uh, you know, uh, textbook no-no. Uh, they shouldn't be working at cross purposes. Uh, Krishna, go ahead. Krishna? Thank you very much. So masterful as always, Raghu. Uh, it's slightly depressing, <laughs> I think, if we, if we look at the, uh, the, you know, the catalog that you detail. Um, so just a couple of thoughts. First of all, uh, you know, on the instruments, I mean, if QE doesn't really work, we don't like forward guidance because of all the problems that we've experienced with it. We're also not that thrilled about having governments jump in in the kind of way they did in this last go around. Um, what are we supposed to do if we are still in or return to a low r star world uh, when we suffer um, you know, serious adverse shocks? Um, are we just assuming the economy is going to stabilize on its own uh, so what's what's the sort of what's the uh, what what are the instruments uh, that we have with uh, respect to shortcomings yes. in the in the framework um I think it's important to recognize that there are sort of multiplicative shortcomings and you detail those well uh, it seemed to me absurd that we should abandon preemptive forward-looking policy uh, and that that was really a separate question from whether we wanted some form of averaging, whether we'd been disciplined enough in terms of specifying or not. Um, when we think about what is consistent across all these regimes, right, it's the desire to stabilize inflation expectations and target. And I wonder if what we're sort of groping towards is some kind of, um, you know, focus that's a little less on the inflation path per se as really trying to find a more disciplined way of managing expectations going forward. So I just appreciate your comments on the above. Yeah, I, I think they're, they're sort of related, right? I mean, um, what can you do in a low R star world? Uh, I would say you can keep interest rates as low as you can get, uh, maybe even uh, go negative, though we don't uh, know if uh, some of the benefits of going negative outweigh the costs. Uh, you know, the Swede, Swedes were quite willing to move out of negative quickly because they didn't find it particularly attractive. Um, but what I'm saying is, is it's not clear to me you have uh, much else in the way of instruments without starting to interfere in pricing, uh, you know, once you enter into various markets uh, or tying your hands once you go into uh, some kind of uh, um, of long-term guarantees, we will not raise interest rates until thus and such happens, uh, guidance, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we've seen the consequences when the regime uh, shifts on you, but we haven't seen uh, you independently being able to move the regime uh, through all this activity. And, and I would say there's a fair case to going back to, you know, boring banking, uh, central banking, where you say, I've done what I could, 
and and now it's up to everybody else. Now, who is everybody else? Well, fiscal, there's much less room going forward, as, as you know, given uh, the amount. I mean, there is still the old IMF uh, uh, saw, which is uh, 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 which is structural reforms, uh, and 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 clearly, you know, with green, uh, with uh, uh, with some of the community uh, uh, issues, the underdevelopment in various communities, and so on, there is a possibility of uh, of structural reforms also helping elevate growth rates. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, we don't get uh, back into a uh, low R star world because of everything else that's going on, including hopefully some of the positive stuff, which is uh, productivity gains from all the uh, good technology that is coming. But uh, but uh, uh, my my quick answer would be, uh, you know, do what you can, but don't don't get into a uh, don't try a whole lot of magic things. Uh, maybe there are some problems you can't solve and you have to leave it to the others, uh, especially uh, the political authority to do what they can. They have fiscal room. If they don't have fiscal room, uh, also contemplate structural changes. Okay, next question behind, uh, sorry, behind you. <laughs> Drago, I want to come back to the statement that the, the central bank should do better by doing less and ask about a sort of a throw a few throwaway sentences that you had about the federal home loan banks and the recent uh, banking problems in earlier 2023 which is it, maybe the central bank should try to do what it's supposed to do well before it ventures into other things so that it seems to have failed pretty miser miserably on bank supervision and regulation, both in 2008 and now again in 2023. So I wanted to hear more of your thoughts about, you know, you said there's a, a trillion dollars was uh, used, by, uh, you know, issued by the federal home loan banks to address financial weaknesses. And what are the implications for that of sort of using other state type banks to deal with a, a problem which seemed to obfuscate you know, what really is going on and maybe hide the failures at the central bank and hence what that's going to mean and the pressures that might put on monetary policy in the future. I just, I wanted to hear your, more of your thoughts on that. Well, a uh, great question. And, uh, and I may be relying on some of your work here uh, without, without acknowledging it, but, but the, uh, I mean, I think the worry is that, um, you know, we've crowded out the private markets uh, for banks. The interbank unsecured bank market no longer exists, right? And and uh, the, you know, when we look at aggregates, we feel comfortable. Okay, there's enough liquidity in the system, but liquidity is not about aggregates, as you well know. It's about where the liquidity is located, and does it move from the place where it's located to where it's not? And as you have seen in the Silicon Valley. Uh, problem, uh, liquidity moved uh, from the banks to the money markets and to the big banks, uh, leaving a hole in the small and medium banks. And uh, the healthy banks weren't willing to fill that hole by lending in. And this is something that Daryl has also documented on a daily basis, the kind of liquidity holding by banks, knowing what might happen. And, and given this problem, uh, I, you know, it, one has to do everything to revive that interbank market, uh, have them sort of uh, on a daily basis understand each other's risks. That can also be a source of discipline, but it can also be a source of, uh, of uh, you know, mutual insurance when, uh, when bad stuff happens. Uh, now that that market doesn't exist and uh, there are the repo markets, but if the repo markets also start blowing out, uh, the lender of last resort becomes the uh, more immediate lender, uh, in this case, through the back door, the, the home loan banks. So I, I do think there's a, a good case for re-examining why these markets for liquidity have dried up. Uh, how do we revive those markets? And how do we uh, not let, uh, let uh, central intervention crowd out those markets? So, uh, Jeff? Jeff Lacker. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your work, Raghu. And uh, I'll start with two cheers for boring central banking. Um, 
But uh, my comment and question has to do with um, the safety net. That's right. The <laughs> core of your uh, analysis and narrative is banks' risk management decisions, balance sheet management decisions, uh, and how they're affected by central bank balance sheet um, dis, um, policies um, over the last decade or two. I would think that as you know, the core of analysis of how banks uh, choose would be their expectations about uh, the likely uh, implications for them of adverse circumstances. And in that connection, I think whether the likelihood that the central bank or some other official entity is going to rescue their creditors uh, and them, it would likely loom large. Those expectations aren't binary. They aren't, you know, zero one. They've evolved over time significantly since the 70s and 80s, as you well know. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems plausible that it's not an accident that the problems we saw earlier this year arose on the soft fringe of uh, the set of banks and banking institutions that were viewed as too big to fail down in the regional sort of the moderate to small size regional banks. Um, so I would think that, um, you know, I wonder what your view about that and its connection to your analysis is, but also I'd think that if you're talking about the lessons learned for central banks, you might want to, you might have something to say about whether they should address the continuing ambiguity and their, their, you know, continuing unwillingness to provide clarity about the extent to which, you know, the safety net's going to be deployed for various institutions. Yeah, I mean, look, I I, I couldn't agree with the import of your question more. That is, uh, we've just verified that uh, there is no bank which is too small to fail. Uh, I mean, uh, or fail in a, in, in a uh, excessively, um, you know, harsh fashion with uh, with depositors running and so on. We're gonna we're gonna uh, sort of come in and and help out, and in this case, help out all the depositors. Uh, I think uh, they haven't been uh, in losses haven't been imposed on an uninsured depositors in any of these failures. Correct me if I'm wrong, but but I think that was the case, uh, and that that creates a, a you know. A, a concern that uh, you know maybe the lesson from Lehman is let no one fail, uh, and if that is the case, then uh, uh, you're putting an enormous weight on getting the supervision right. Uh, otherwise, it's a direct uh, sort of transfer from taxpayers to these entities. I would also worry about the non-bank system uh, that you know many players are. Uh, uh, Taking uh, risks which uh, which could uh, accumulate, uh, and uh, if a tail event occurs, they're really out on a limb. I mean, hundred to one leverage and so on. And of course, uh, the bet is at those times the Fed will come in and uh, and help out, and so you get uh, a lot more leveraging of that kind that uh, that is happening. So uh, I'd say this is still a problem we haven't solved. And uh, and certainly something we need to think long and hard about. Uh, how do we impose losses? I mean, uh, uh, Luigi Zingales and I wrote a piece which uh, uh, you know uh, I think uh, uh, is seems uh, pretty straightforward, which is we should have let at least one bank, bank uh, banks, uninsured depositors take losses, maybe bail out the rest, but. Have the first one at least take losses. There's a paper in the Journal of Finance which says this, and we thought it was a, a good idea. But you have to let some of the losses fall where they should. Let me let me stop there. Steve, go ahead. Thanks, Raghu. Um, two observations and a question. So first picks up on something John said, in which Mickey Levy is documented in his paper presented at the Monetary Policy Conference last year at Hoover. And that is the perception errors and the forecast errors made by the Fed over the past uh, two or three years. So I would think that that would lead to a considerable loss of confidence in the Fed's credibility, not with on the usual hawkishness, dovishness dimension, but just their technical competence. Okay, so I'm 
that's an assertion. You can agree or disagree with it. The second observation is we've just lived in the past three and a half years through the biggest swings of inflation in the United States and many other advanced economies in recent decades. I would think that that would cause many economic agents to start paying more attention to monetary policy and inflation statistics than they did in the past. So then the question with these two observations is what, what is this loss of confidence in the technical competence of the Fed and the increased attention by many economic agents to inflation and monetary policy? What does that mean for the conduct of monetary policy going forward? including possibly the design of a, of a new framework. Could, could I just add, there was also a brilliant Steve Davis comment at that last uh, uh, <laughs> conference where, where Davis pointed out that um, the Fed was in a catch-22 problem. It wants to stop inflation. If it issues forecasts that there's going to be inflation, then inflation's going to break out. So it cannot issue honest forecasts. It wasn't just technical problems. There was an yeah. incentive problem. Thank you, John. Roger. <laughs> Yeah, I was just trying to pull up a slide uh, which uh, which reflects the point that Steve just made. It's taking too long. Let me just uh, oh, oh, here it is. Uh, can you see this uh, this page? Uh, you see the graph on the right hand side, uh, which is Fed forecasts of uh, PC projection, uh, which constantly has it coming down neatly over the forecast horizon, and we know. Uh, that that was excessively optimistic. Uh, I mean, that's that's just uh, reaffirming what you said. I mean, what is interesting is is despite uh, the Fed being wrong in forecasting, uh, when you look at uh, medium term indicators of uh, of red credibility, uh, you know, five year, five year forwards, and so on, uh, it's been rock solid at uh, two and change. Uh, 2.3 when I last checked, but it had gone up to 2.45 in, in, at, at, uh, at some point and came down after that. So the Fed has somehow maintained confidence that it'll, it'll get things done uh, despite these uh, the failure of forecasts. Uh, uh, is the point then that these forecasts don't matter? People think that they're going to do it by the seat of their pants and somehow they'll get it done and uh, we don't really need to worry about it. I don't know, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, you raise a very good question. Should they have lost credibility in the process? Uh, and they you know, may not have, uh, at least as of now. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Steve, what was your second question? The well, one was just about economic agents or many economic agents, not financial market participants, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but individual households, smaller yeah. businesses, less interest rate sensitive sectors. Right. You would expect they're, they just lived through this unusual episode in, their, right. in the history of their lives. Right. And you'd expect they'd be paying more attention uh, to monetary policy and inflation now on yeah. a regular basis than they did in the past. What does that mean for the conduct of monetary policy? I, I think uh, I think they would have become more sensitive to inflation, right? And um, you know the old uh, um, statement that uh, when you don't really care about where it is, uh, that's the right level that it it doesn't impinge on your daily decisions. And now they're they're seeing it matter when they go to the grocery store. Uh, the the other thing to John's earlier. Uh, point about inflation coming down, um, you know, I, I wonder if, uh, what about catch up? Uh, do we worry about, uh, you know, uh, workers wanting to uh, catch up in their wages, given that uh, they've experienced a pretty significant bout of inflation? Uh, uh, and over that, uh, that period, the real wages, uh, uh, real wage growth was negative. Do, is there going to be a period of catch up and how does that play out? I, I don't know. Uh, I just think that there will be more sensitivity and uh, I think we may be a little optimistic uh, if we think uh, it's all done and, and gone. Larry should be, Larry. Thanks, John. Thanks for, <clears throat> for the excellent presentation. Um, I look forward to reading the book. Uh, the question I have is just getting back to John Cochran's comment about the, you know, the, the next round of frameworks. And as you know, in many inflation targeting jurisdictions, uh, 
especially in the smaller ones, central banks have this control range around the inflation target. And the U.S. and the ECB have, has avoided having a control range. It just seems like having a control range, for example, one to three, like, for example, we had at the Bank of Canada, just gives you a way, a more robust framework to deal with low and high inflation targeting, you know, uh, regimes. You know, that may be the way of getting the robustness you need to still remain preemptive, but at the same time, being able to tolerate inflation below target when you're in sort of the low inflation regime. I, I think that's a great point. Uh, and, and actually, even the ECB had an asymmetric target, right, for a while. Uh, and this was the, uh, you know, uh, up to two, uh, but not, uh, they didn't uh, make a big deal if it was below two. And somehow that changed to make it symmetric around two. Uh, and maybe that was the post pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, anxiety about trying to, uh, you know, enhance economic activity through, uh, through monetary policy. So uh, I'm entirely with you that a, a range makes uh, a lot of sense. It, it allows the central bank to be less hyperactive so long as things are broadly within the range and uh, and likely to drift towards the middle. And, you know, it can be a, a little more relaxed. Uh, that may be the way to deal with this, this issue. <laughs> David Malpass. David? Yeah, can you hear me? Hi, all. Um, thank you, John, and thanks, uh, Raghu. And so I have uh, comments and then a question. Um, it, it, uh, very good that you explained the duration impact. That was significant. And also very good you explained the difference in size of banks regarding the un their dependence on uninsured bank deposits and also the importance on the interbank market. So I want to come to that. Uh, the the in addition to the liquidity arbitrage that's going on among the banks, there's a leverage uh, ratio that's uh, that's constrained, and it's constrained differentially among big banks versus small banks. And so, one thing I observe is the, uh, you know, the uh, the size of the arbitrage uh, that's going on on the liquidity side is massive. You know, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, in order to accomplish the off balance sheet instruments that you're that we're working on and the fed is uh uh is trying to make all of that arbitrage safe so a key question or a key point that you're making is how do we impose losses um in in order to have some discipline within the market my observation is right now there isn't discipline that everything is safe uh, because the Fed is drawing kind of a red line around all arbitrage kinds of activity. Uh, so my question is on, uh, you didn't mention the leverage ratio. Do you see that it's constraining different size banks differently? And thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, um, um, uh, uh, thanks, David. I, I, I think the, uh, you know, some people have raised this issue and, uh, uh, for some time, uh, I think there were some exemptions uh, given to the banks uh, on the leverage ratio applying to high quality securities like reserves. And uh, then that was reinstated and that's when the money market funds came in in a big way uh, to absorb reserves. Um, I mean, I, look, I, I think uh, to the extent that the leverage ratio impinges on safe activities, it's worth re-examining. Uh, and uh, because that was not the purpose of the leverage ratio, it was to inhibit uh, risky activities. But once you start a whole range of exemptions, then you go back to the old problem. Uh, you have risk-based capital and who knows what is risky. Uh, the wrong, you know, mortgage-backed, AAA rated mortgage-backed securities turned out to be more risky than we thought. So, I mean, there's there's some by intermediate point where you recognize safe assets don't necessarily need to attract the leverage ratio, but somehow you still prevent banks from being levered 50 to one. Yes, um, so so I'm concerned about the, the strategic framework and Jay Powell says the Fed's gonna undertake this 
review in the second half of next year. And when we look back at the at the process that led to the strategic framework in August 2020, um, it was it was all asymmetric thinking that led to an asymmetric interpretation of its dual mandate, getting rid of the preemptive, you know, the the average inflation, average you know, average inflation adjusted targets and all that. Um, and and in fact, I went I went back and. Um, read Jay Powell's speech he gave that that Chicago Fed seminar that culminated their their strategic planning and in 19 paragraphs uh he focused on um on the effect of zero bound um in 10 of the paragraphs so it, it, and then all of the papers given at that conference that's an exaggeration most of the papers were about how to deal with the the effect of zero bound and, and what kind of strategies would work best. So the question is, will the Fed um, change from its asymmetric thinking as it as it considers the new, you know, how to review the the strategy? And and I question that because the Fed has this tendency to keep things the way they are. And in fact, Recently, we've heard some Federal Reserve members say, well, the the new strategic plan is just fine. We just um, didn't interpret it. Our tactics were wrong, but, the, but, but let's keep things the way they are. And so I'm very concerned about just the Fed's whole approach to how it thinks about a strategy. And it gets to this issue, uh, does it just let bygones be bygones? Can they now do a victory lap that inflation's come down and go on their merry way? I hope not. Uh, I mean, I, I have to believe that they will be informed by some of what went wrong. Whether it's, it's adequate for what you're saying, it's hard to say. I don't have a lot to add on this. I just hope that they think carefully. Uh, I mean, I, I, I really hope they do. Again, nothing to add to that. Well, Raghu, I have a, a question. You, you have you speaking as an experienced central banker in a very important part of the world, but you didn't talk about that part of the world very much. It's on a lot of our minds. You know what's what's going on with China? What's going on with Russia? What's going on with India? Could you say just a couple words about that? Yeah. Uh, should we adopt your decision? You, you, you say there's problem with rules or strategies, but what do you think about the global situation? Could you say a few words about that? You're talking about the Indian economy and, and its relations right now rather than Indian monetary policy? Yes. Yeah, no, look, um, India had a, a very bad um, pandemic. And uh, it's recovering reasonably strongly at this point, but it's a two-phase recovery. What you hear about uh, the big firms, the celebration, the stock markets, it's hit some, some record high at this point. Um, inflation has been relatively quiet, uh, but there's a, there's a hurting part of the economy, the small and medium sectors, uh, some of the rural areas, there's uh, there's stress um, and unemployment rates are quite high. Uh, a lot of, I mean, we we have around six and a half percent growth at this point, but that's not creating enough jobs in the economy, uh, and certainly not uh, making for the backlog of jobs uh, at this point. So um, when you look at India, it's it's sort of uh, you know, huge contrast. There's some really impressive uh, firms, uh, really impressive uh, achievements. I just went to a, a small firm in uh, in uh, in the south, which was making 3D printed rockets, uh, essentially going to send up one satellite at a time on a customized basis, um, and they were all gung ho about it, uh, enthused uh, by becoming Elon Musk's. Um, so that's on one side, and then you have, uh, you know, uh, 
the pandemic hit education everywhere. But in India, which already had bad levels of education on average, the fifth grade student can't do math at the second grade level. Around 50% of them can't do that. Uh, that suggests uh, that the pandemic hit education really hard. Uh, my, my worry is this government that we have is much more focused on capital investment, on infrastructure build out, which India do, does need, and much less focused on uh, improving human capital, which may be where India uh, sort of uh, India's greatest deficiencies with respect to the future lie. Uh, we have 1.5 million engineers being generated every year but about half of them are unemployable and uh, a big fraction of the remaining, you know, can do low level jobs rather than high quality engineering jobs. The silver lining is the best trained are doing fantastically well. Uh, Goldman Sachs has a huge office in India and there are 1600, uh, you know, global capability offices like that employing, uh, you know, uh, 10,000 people at a time. So that's a big source of employment and growing, but that's sort of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lower level. That's the bifurcated part that I talked about, which I worry very much about because that's where the social conflict uh, starts coming. Um, on the political side, Modi just won a state election. Uh, I mean, he has uh, uh, mesmerized the electorate. And uh, he's given enough in the form of direct transfers, freebies, uh, to make people's lives a little better. Even if they don't have jobs, um, they have some money from coming from the government. So all in all, he's probably going to get reelected. Uh, in my view, it doesn't speak well for democracy going forward. But that's the state of the nation as it is. And let me just mention, we still have copies of this beautiful book, Monetary Policy and its Unintended Consequences by Raghav Rajan. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your ideas with us about this very important issue. Thank you, Raghav. Thank you.